Good morning. For those of you that may not know me, I'm Chuck Cobby. I'm one of the elders here at First Southern. Uh, John asked me to, to speak today. Uh, it's not my thing. <laughs> In spite of the fact that at one time I went to college to go into the ministry. And uh, I always thought maybe I was like Jonah and I ran away from it. But uh, I don't believe that I went because I was called. I was called to go to the Bible college. And uh, a lot of things in my life have developed since then. But I don't think preaching is one of my strong points. Uh, but in spite of that, uh, my philosophy is to be a servant to God wherever he wants to use me. And uh, so I do what I can do when I'm asked to. And if I can't fulfill that, I won't be asked again. So <laughs> now John last week, he just he said something like, I hope you know, Chuck doesn't do too good. And I, I didn't tell him, but I'm sure he doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, I'd like to uh, start with a word of prayer. Let's bow. Our Father, we ask for your blessing upon this gathering. We ask a blessing upon the reading of your word, upon this congregation, upon each one here, as we come to give glory to you, as we come to sing praises to you, as we come to hear your word, to learn, but most of all, that we might draw closer to you, to a deeper commitment to serving you in all things. I pray that you will speak through me, that these would be your words and not mine, that you might be glorified and not me. Uh, I just pray that we speak the words of truth, uh, that these things might touch us, that we might examine ourselves and see where we stand in our relationship to you, that we might truly know uh, where we stand in our love and dedication to you. We ask for your blessings upon this uh, time, upon your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we're going to have our scripture this morning. I'm uh, taking this from Second Peter, first chapter. Uh, they've been asking me what the title of my message was, and I'm not good at coming up with titles. Uh, not, never good at coming up with ideas. Uh, when I was uh, in school, I was always uh, putting stuff off to the last because I couldn't settle on something. I remember in English class, we had a teacher whose name was Mrs. Dean, and we always called her Theme Dean because we always wrote themes. And we usually wrote them in class. And uh, so it had just a short one, so she'd tell us to write one. And five minutes to go in class, I'm still sitting there trying to think of what I'm going to write about. Uh, so I started thinking about a topic months ago that I would speak about because I knew John would nail me sometime and want me to speak. Well, this isn't it. <laughs> I started with that a few weeks ago and it, it changed as the week went on. Uh, but I, this came to me uh, earlier this week, and I've been working on this. And so uh, we're going to read from Second Peter, uh, first chapter, verses 3 through 8. Uh, if you would stand for the reading of God's word. If you'll follow along, either in your Bible or on the screen. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and good godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to your goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, 
it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Now, in case you don't see me thumbing through my Bible, the passages I'm going to quote I have written down because I'd be fumbling too much. <laughs> uh, this passage is a message from Peter to Christians, especially the Christians in Asia Minor. Uh, this was probably written somewhere between uh, 60 and 65 AD. Uh, the Christians were being persecuted. These Christians were being persecuted. And uh, Peter's writing to them to encourage them, uh, to talk to them about their faith, to remain faithful. Uh, being persecuted, they probably had a lot of questions like we have. God, why are you letting this happen? God, don't you love me? God, haven't I showed you that I love you? Why? Why are these things happening? We always start asking questions when those things happen. Peter was writing to encourage them by having them reflect on their Christian growth. If we think about our Christian growth, we'll think about what God has done, what we've learned. Therefore, we should be able to see where our faith stands, where we really stand, and how it has grown, how it has increased. I think we can look at this passage and evaluate our faith, how strong it is, and whether we are growing in it. Now, what is faith? We're told in Hebrews 11.1 1, what faith is. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, I know that sometimes has been kind of confusing to us, depending on which translation we read. But that's hoping for things and being certain about things that we really can't be sure of. Faith, I think, exists in different, what I'll call sizes. I don't know whether sizes is the right term. You know, from small faith to great faith. It's not easy to measure your faith. How does faith start? Does it start out small and eventually grow? Uh, not necessarily. Somebody can have fairly strong faith right off the bat. Now, it may be misplaced. Uh, think about a child. A child may just automatically have faith in something. And uh, they may think that they have faith that they can do something. It's not because it grew. For some reason, they just think they've got faith to do it. And then they try something and they fail. Uh, some kids, small kids, think they can drive a car. And some of them have tried it. Uh, and they fail. Uh, even as adults, we think we uh, may have a lot of faith in some things. Uh, I've done construction, carpentry, miscellaneous things, maintenance, all my life. Uh, several years ago, when we were in Ellsworth, uh, I decided to put up a porch swing on my front porch. I was confident in my abilities. I had faith in my abilities, so I hung it up, screwed the hooks in the roof, in the ceiling of the porch, and called my wife out, said, let's, let's sit on it. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether it swung once or twice, but down it came. Uh, It didn't take very long uh, before that happened and it kind of smashed my confidence in myself. Uh, maybe I had too much faith in the materials, uh, in, in what I was doing, uh, but uh, I misplaced my faith in something, uh, probably my abilities to assess the situation. Well, after that uh, disaster, every time I built something, which has been quite often, uh, Donnie's faith in me had to grow, depend, depending on how well it turned out. Uh, the more times I did something and the better it came out, then the next time she wasn't quite as uh, skeptical about me doing something. Uh, our relationships with others is the same way. It will grow or it will decline uh, depending on how we perform. 
what we do and how we act, how we live up to expectations, how we live up to doing what we said we would do. Uh, faith can, can waver. It can go up, it can go down. Our faith in God will grow when we learn how he treated his children uh, and how he cares for us. If we study and see through the Bible what he has done with his children, uh, it should increase our faith. Now, we can look and see the things that didn't go well, but it wasn't God's problem. It was their problem. The scripture tells us how much he loves us, and we can over time uh, see over time that this is true. But too often, we blame God for circumstances instead of seeing them as being our own fault. Uh, and instead of seeing the blessings uh, that he has given us. We often are ready to blame him instead of waiting and trusting on him. Uh, we need to trust him to take care of things. Now Peter gives us a reason for growing in our faith, and it's in our scripture. And it's because of the promises God has given us. And starting in verse 3, we read, He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Now, we may not think about that, but he's given it to us. The first thing we need, probably, is Jesus Christ. But another thing that's definitely there is we're made in his image. He has given us these things. He's given us a mind. He's given us abilities. But he's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Through his own glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises. I don't, hadn't thought about his promises being uh, what we needed for life and goodliness, godliness, but it is. Why are these given? It says, so that we may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Make every effort to add to your faith. So if we're want to escape the corruption. Uh, we want to participate in his divine nature, and we need to add to our faith. I have a question. When, when does faith start? Did you have some faith when you accepted Christ? I think you had to have some faith to have accepted him. Did you have faith before that? Is it something that we develop? I think we develop it through the hearing of the gospel. Is it just given to us and not to some others? Why do some not believe? Because they have no faith? We read in Romans 10, 17, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ goes with a passage that John read about how do they hear without someone to preach and it doesn't necessarily mean standing up here preaching how do people hear without someone telling them uh, people will not come to faith I don't know whether we have are born with a little bit of faith uh, God might have put a seed of faith in everybody uh, or the ability to have some faith. But people don't always build upon that and don't listen to the word, don't study the word, and that faith doesn't grow. Uh, doesn't grow enough to where they understand who Jesus is, what God has done, and to accept him as Savior. I believe our faith is something that we receive, not something we come up with, not something we create in ourselves. I believe it's a gift from God. Is it given to us initially when we're born? You know, where, whenever it comes, wherever it comes, it is a gift of God. We have to thank him for that. It's not because we're so smart that we figured it out and we grabbed onto it and we made something of it. If faith comes from hearing the gospel, then does it not grow from further study of God's word and from experiencing God? 
it's not just the study. It's understanding what God is saying and getting into it and building a relationship with God. Now, there are two kinds of faith. I've already talked about one, the, a temporary human faith where we have faith in ourselves or things. Uh, that temporary human faith is trusting in something in this world. Uh, I think most all of you probably have a favorite sports team. Maybe some of you like horse racing. We, we love horse racing, watch it on TV. Uh, as you watch your team play or your horse race, uh, you might have enough faith in that team or that horse that they're gonna win. You might have enough faith that you decide to go place a bet on it. Uh, you might have a lot of faith and place a large bet on it. Or you might just be stupid, I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> whatever it is, that's kind of a faith. We trust in something for whatever reason. We look at what they've done in the past. We, oh, they, you know, we just like them. Uh, we went to horse races one time on vacation and the kids were little. And, you know, we would study the guide and pick our horse. Dina, who I think probably was only three or four at the time, probably picked more winners than we did. So we asked her, how did you pick them? Well, I like the name. <laughs> So her faith was, wasn't really faith, it was just something she liked. Ours probably wasn't faith because we didn't know enough to have faith in something. But we can start uh, picking things and, and having faith in things, but a human faith can be wrong. And the proof of that is look at Vegas or the racing tracks and look at all the losers. Uh, you know, for somebody to win, and somebody and the people that are promoting it make money, a lot of people have got to lose. So just that faith, that human faith, is not a sure thing. Uh, in Romans 1, 17, we're told of going from faith to faith. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That's kind of a confusing term. How do you go from faith to faith? One idea is that this might be going from a human faith to a spiritual faith. I don't know if that's what this really means. It could be. Maybe we, you know, we all have some kind of human faith, but as we learn about Christ, we can go to a spiritual faith. Uh, in some translations, this reads, uh, instead of from faith to faith, it is by faith from first to last. And the commentaries indicate that what this really means uh, by faith from first to last is it's, it's only by faith. It's faith from the beginning to the end. Faith is the only thing. Uh, the only way of righteousness comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I, I believe that is absolutely right. The other thought or meaning of that may or may not be right, but it's interesting to think about. However faith comes to us, you have to realize it's not our doing. It's God's doing in us. Our part is what Peter talks about, and that is adding to our spiritual faith. Uh, none of the things that Peter talks about adding have anything to do with our human faith, but have everything to do with our spiritual faith. When we put faith in a sports team or a racehorse, the stock market, my own abilities, or lack of abilities, my job, my spouse, my children, my elected officials, myself, uh, nothing is a sure thing in those. They can all fail and probably all will fail. Uh, Remember the old saying, there's only two things that are, that are sure. What are they? Death and taxes. Well, God proved that death isn't even sure. He has raised the dead. Now, some might argue he hadn't done away with the taxes, but uh, that's kind of beside the point. Another thing that we talk about always being sure of is the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Well, 
God even proved that he can do something about that. Uh, Joshua 10.13 tells us, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. So if God can do those things, raise the dead, stop the sun, uh, he's a sure thing. When he says something, uh, you know he has the power to do it. And he will do it. If you want to bet on a sure thing, you should put your faith in God and continue to grow in it. As our faith and trust in God increases, these things should be added. And these are from our scripture. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. But why do those have to be added? Don't we already have those? Well, if we do, we don't have very much of them. The human nature does not possess that much of these. Do you possess them? Do you possess a small portion of these qualities? Can you attain them on your own? Can you look at those and make you a list and put it up on your refrigerator and work on them every day that you're going to uh, work at getting better at each of these? Well, we probably can to some degree, but we won't get there. We won't accomplish much in that on our own. Can you be serving Christ without these or without the fruits of the Spirit? The fruits of the Spirit are listed in Galatians 5.22. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, very similar qualities. But these are fruits of the Spirit, not fruits of our own effort. And I believe these others, things that have to be added, do not come because we're trying to do it. It only comes through the Spirit working in us, in us giving our lives to, them, to Him. I think they can come in degrees. I think it's a growing process. I don't believe it's that the Spirit just zaps you one day with one of these or multi multiple of these, and all of a sudden, bam, you have love, peace, joy. We may have a degree of that in Christ, but how do we fully attain it? Well, the perseverance that we need will help us do it, but it, it's a process. It's progressive. So how do we achieve any of this? Any positive, godly change in our character must come from God. So if I haven't received any of them, then it must be God's fault. He didn't give them to me. If they come from the Spirit, the Spirit didn't give them to me, I just go on my way. No, that's not it. Uh, what do we do? What should we do? The receiving of these gifts are to glorify God, not just our benefit. They will benefit us. But ultimately, they are to benefit God. They are to help us to be more like God, to be holy. We are to become holy. How do we become holy? What is becoming holy? You know, there's a fancy word for that, sanctification. It's a process of becoming holy. Uh, you accepted Christ. Bam, are we holy? Maybe a little holier than we were. But to be holy, to be like God, is a process. It's sanctification. It's a continual process. And what's the end of that process? Total sanctification. What's that called? Glorification. And that isn't going to happen here. For us to be with God in eternity, we need to be holy. We can't be less than holy to be with God. So, what do we do? We can't do that by just our efforts and our works. We don't get there. How many, how many times do we try doing things and it doesn't work? All our New Year's resolutions, all our promises, all our whatever we fail. Only God can help us to overcome those. Only God through the Spirit can do that. Uh, we are in the process of sanctification 
when we are putting ourselves in God's presence through submission to his Holy Spirit, to his will, through prayer, study, and the knowledge of his word. We have to be consistent in seeking those things, to be in communication, and that's to be in the presence of God all the time. Well, what's our problem with doing these things? Our biggest problem is ourselves, our selfishness. We claim that we give our lives to God and Christ when we accept Jesus, but we still try to live for ourselves. We think that we will live for God so long as, you know, we basically can do what we want the rest of the time. You know, we, we hear the term Sunday Christians. A Sunday Christian is not a Christian. A Christian is following Christ all the time. Are we really doing that? What are we doing through every day of our lives? Are we getting out and doing the things for Christ? Uh, are we getting out of our comfort zone? As John talked about in Paula with this uh, party, block party we're having. Is it out of your comfort zone to go out and hand out uh, invitations? Out of your comfort zone to go talk to someone about Christ? I'm sure it is. This is out of our comfort zone. If you want to know where my comfort zone is, don't ask my wife. She'll tell you. It's sitting in the chair, watching TV, doing puzzles, something of that nature. That's comfortable. I can relax. My mind's off everything. But that's not what God asks us to do. That's living for myself. Giving in to God's call when you're called to do something. Even if it's to stand up and, and give a sermon, teach a class, help with the kids, usher, go visit a sick person, give somebody a ride. Yeah, we do a lot of these things, but we usually do them because they're convenient for us. You know, as long as it's not out of my comfort zone, I don't mind doing these. Our giving, that's all right, as long as I'm comfortable giving. As long as it doesn't take too much out of, and I, you know, away from me, so I can't go do this or I can't go do that. Examine our lives and see what we're doing. Are we living it for ourselves or are we living it for Christ? Giving our lives to God means giving up your lives. Giving up yourself. It means being a living sacrifice. That's the term used in Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. What is a sacrifice? Something you've given up. You give your tithe, your offering. That's kind of a sacrifice. You're giving it away. God asks us to give our bodies as a living sacrifice, not necessarily to die, to die if he asks us to, but he's asking us to be a living sacrifice. How can you be a living sacrifice? How can your body be a living sacrifice to God when you want to control everything it does or the majority of what it does? We're too much like the rich young man that Jesus spoke of in Mark 10, 17. He asked, the young man asked what he needed to do to gain eternal life. And Jesus said to keep all the commandments. He said, oh, I've done that all my life. Then Jesus said, well, then you need to go and sell everything you own and give it to the poor and to follow Jesus. There's two conditions on that. He couldn't do it. He walked away. He couldn't give all of himself. He couldn't commit completely, so he went on his way. I'm not sure just how completely we are committed to God, to Jesus Christ, because we want to hang on to so many things instead of giving ourselves to him. Are we really seeking God's direction and control in our lives? I think maybe sometimes we're willing to accept some uh, general directions from him 
in certain things. Maybe, maybe some specifics, as long as they don't interfere with what we want. Uh, but we probably uh, don't give in to everything that he wants. Why? We think he's asking too much. You know. And it probably comes down to, it's a selfish part that we consider pleasure. And a lot of our life isn't necessarily pleasurable, but we want control of it. Is that what Jesus said when God asked him to give his life for us? What did Jesus say in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest, his torture, and his crucifixion? In Mark 14, 35, it says, Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Has our faith grown enough that we can truly say, God, but what you will in my life? Peter tells us to add to your faith. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you productive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we productive? Not just in our knowledge in what we've learned, but our true knowledge of Christ is knowing what he wants of us. Let's take stock of the qualities in our life and the fruits of the Spirit that manifest themselves in our lives. I'm sure we all fall short of God's desire for us. Let's commit ourselves to a full relationship with Christ and to seek to become holy through him in order to glorify God and to, above all, to be able to participate in his divine nature because our nature is not divine. It will only be divine through him. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I need you to help me in my faith and in my life to live for you. I ask you to increase my faith. I ask you to add to my goodness. I ask you to add to my knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you to add to my self-control to control my selfishness. I ask you to add to my perseverance in seeking you and living for you. I ask you to add to my goodness because without you, I have no goodness. I ask you to add to my love so I can love others and to love my enemies as Christ has loved me. Forgive us of our selfishness and fill us with your spirit and endow us with your gifts in order that we may glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen.